Albert Presto is a research professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University and a member of the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies, CAPS. Presto's research focuses on pollutant emissions from energy extraction and consumption and subsequent atmospheric transformations of these emissions. He collaborates with medical professionals to develop detailed studies of pollutant exposure on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis to better understand the relationship between pollutant emissions and adverse health effects such as childhood asthma and other diseases. I would now request uh, Dr. Presto to please take over the mic and deliver the lecture. They're going to put up slides. My goal with this is that this would be a, mostly a discussion and not so much me talking. So I have about hopefully 10 minutes of comments. Um, and then I would like it to be a discussion. And I think it would be nice if we had some you know, record of this discussion. So is someone either assigned to take, to take notes or is someone willing to take notes? I heard something, but I don't know what. Awesome. OK, we have notes, notes happening. Very good. OK, so this, uh, this breakout is going to be about performance and sort of long-term performance of gas sensors. And I was glad to see lots of talks today about, it, there were, it was mostly PM sensors, but some were about gas sensors. But no one really talked about long-term performance, so nothing I'm going to show is a repeat. So uh, I'm excited about that. Um, so we all know this at this point. You know, at some point, you're going to put together your sensor box, or you're going to buy something from some vendor, and you're going to test it at your reference site. Here's our reference site from when we were testing ramps in 2016. Um, and you know we had a whole farm of them, and our reference site is actually off the, the picture to the right-hand side. Um, right, we saw lots of figures like this today. This is sensor performance after sort of adjusting the, the raw sensor output um, and, and applying a calibration model. So here the horizontal axis. This is for ozone. Horizontal axis is the reference monitor measurement. The vertical axis is the adjusted sensor output and we can get good performance, right? So we saw a lot of figures like this today. Um, some of the CSTEP folks showed some nice um, examples of looking at different types of models. That's something we did as well. I should point out, everything I'm showing that's from, from our work at Carnegie Mellon is, was done in the US. Um, and so our conditions are a little bit different than some of the stuff that you saw today that was, that was focused a lot in India and Africa. Um, but we saw plots like this earlier today as well, right, where we have the correlation coefficient on the horizontal axis plotted backwards, right, so that one is at the origin. And then the, the variability of the error is plotted on the vertical axis, right, so a perfect sensor would land at the origin. And so Carl Malings did a bunch of work looking at different types of calibration models. Here's performance for a bunch of different models for, for CO, electrochemical sensors. Um, you can see there's, a, there's sort of a cluster of models, the blue, the pink, the green, and the brown point that are all giving pretty similar performance and other model uh, architectures that are performing less well. Um, and then, of course, we get different, different performance for different gases. So in general, the NO2 sensors don't work as well as the CO and ozone sensors. Um, and so here for NO2, the, the correlation coefficients are lower and the uh, errors are bigger, right? You notice the, the, the Y scale on the right-hand plot goes, is, is much higher than, the, uh, than on the left-hand plot. Uh, one thing I don't think anyone necessarily showed much of today is that you know, we're, we're all testing these sensors at some central site and then distributing them across you know, our, our, our study domain. Um, and in some cases, that you know, you can test them in a central at a, a site with with reference monitors, and then deploy them to a different site with reference monitors to evaluate how much the 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 performance is changing. And so here's an example. This is uh, the results of us moving some CO sensors um, within the same city. So we tested them at one location in a city, 
move them to a different location that also had reference monitors in the same city. And this is just for two sensors. So the open symbol is the where we first tested it, and then the closed symbol is to where it got moved to. So you can see this green sensor, um, the performance degraded when we moved it, but not by a lot, right? So the, the correlation coefficient got a little bit worse, the error got a little bit worse, but the blue sensor was basically the same at the two locations. But in general, when we stayed within one city, the, again, this was all within one city, the performance was similar at, at, at if we moved it to a different, um, to a different reference site. And so then we were able to deploy this, so we, you know, we've put out a network, many of you have put out networks, and we're able to capture the spatial variations that we expect. So this is some, some of our very first data that we were able to produce back in 2016. This is NO2 spatial variations, um, and what we see are the sites that have higher NO2 are the ones that are where we would expect there to be higher NO2. Those are the sites with, um, there are a few sites that are labeled downtown. Let's see, do we have a, I guess we don't have a pointer. Um, the ones that are labeled downtown are in the center of the city. They have higher traffic. That other one on the right that has high NO2 is next to a highway, right? So we get these spatial patterns that we expect. We deployed our network over a long enough time that we were able to evaluate how, it's really this, how the sensor plus the calibration model change their performance over time. So I'm gonna show examples for three gases. So here's CO, here's a CO sensor, it's performance when we, when it was new at our central site, right? It worked really well. We had a high correlation coefficient and a low error. And then one year later, we brought that sensor back, you know, we deployed it in the field, we brought it back to our central site, here's its performance. So the performance degraded, but again, not by a lot. Um, and that degradation was different for different gases. So here's an example, um, here's ozone. Again, the filled symbol is when it was new and the open symbol is after a year. Uh, and the ozone sensor, this particular ozone sensor, performed about as well after a year as it did when it was new. Um, but NO2, you know, NO2 started out the worst of these three and then it got substantially worse after a year. To the point where basically after one year the NO2 sensor was not necessarily useful as a sensor. Right? The correlation was very low, the error was 50%, it was not super useful. What we discovered in our domain, in, in where we did our work in, in the US, is that these electrochemical sensors, and I'm calling out AlphaSense because that's who we used, but the AlphaSense NO2 electrochemical sensors lasted for about a year. The reason for that is because the NO2 sensors um, are cross-sensitive to ozone, um, so these are both electrochemical reductions. You can reduce NO2 at about the same potential you can reduce ozone. And so the way these sensors are manufactured is that they have a scrubber to keep the ozone from getting into the sensor unit. And so when the sensor is new and the scrubber is new, it does a good job of preventing ozone from getting into the sensor, and then you measure NO2. Over time, that scrubber gets consumed, and so Eventually, ozone starts penetrating in, it damages your signal, and eventually the scrubber is completely consumed, and then your sensor is essentially responding to both ozone and NO2, and your NO2 signal is no longer sort of discernible. And so we can see what that looks like in terms of data. Um, so here's performance of, of some new sensors. So the raw sensor signal, just the millivolt output, is shown on the x-axis and our reference NO2 concentration is on the vertical axis. This is data from new sensors. Um, the, the dashed line just sort of encircles the data because I'm gonna use that as a reference on subsequent panels. But we can see that the data, that the sensor output is correlated to the NO2 concentration. It's noisy, right? The R squared isn't one, but it's, there's a correlation there. As the sensors age, so now these are sensors that are about four months old, there's still correlation, but one, it's drifted, right? So if I was to fit a linear regression to that leftmost panel, panel A, and use it, um, that panel should be B. Apparently when I made the slides, I had lost my ability to do the alphabet. Um, if, if I applied it to the middle panel, it, it wouldn't work, right? I would get an erroneous um, concentration. I would need to recalibrate these, but 
but there's still correlation there. But if we look after about a year, um, there's, no, there's no correlation at all, right? So this is the point where the, the scrubber has been depleted, um, ozone is, is interfering with the sensor response, and, and so this sensor is not working as a sensor anymore. Another thing to consider is that, and I'm sure some of you have run into this, sometimes out of the box a sensor just doesn't work very well. So here's a, a, a time series for these NO2 sensors. So this, the x-axis is just days from the time we open them. And the horizontal, the vertical axis is, is, a, is, one, is a correlation coefficient. It's not R, it's a different correlation coefficient. But it works like most correlation coefficients. One is good and zero is bad. And so what we see is that as the sensors get old, they tend to start with a relatively high correlation coefficient, and that goes down with time. Uh, but you'll notice that you know, while most sensors, when they're brand new, had this correlation coefficient around 0.8, one's a little bit lower. There's one that started around 0.6, and then there's one down there that started under 0.2. Right? So sometimes, out of the box, these sensors just don't work very well. We also had experience that sometimes sensors made from one batch to the next behave differently. So this is, I, I know that the lines are a little bit hard to see, um, but the point here on this is that we had a lot of success with ozone sensors. The ozone sensors in general work very well. At one point, we bought a new batch of ozone sensors. They were made from a different lot than previous batches than we had, that we had bought, and they had totally different behavior. Um, and so we had to monitor those separately. We had to recalibrate them separately. Um, and we ended up having this batch of sensors we never really got good data out of because we were sort of spending all the time monitoring them because they behaved differently than all the other sensors that we had. All right. So that's my overview. Um, here are a couple of questions that I'm, I'm suggesting for discussion. We don't have to discuss these questions. But what I really want this is to be a discussion. I want to do minimum talking from this point on. Um, you know, so just so, some potential questions here. What are your experiences with the gas sensors and their performance and their degradation over time? What gases are most important to measure? And related to that, what resolution is, is necessary, right? Do we need PPB resolution on all of these gases? Um, what strategies have you used to ensure good performance of sensor networks? Um, you know, what techniques or what, you know, is it possible to test for sensor performance or sensor degradation uh, in situ, or is the only way to do that to bring all the sensors back to the central site and re re rerun the calibration? Um, so again, these are some potential questions for, cal uh, for discussion, uh, but now I want to open the floor uh, and, and let people comment uh, and, and sort of have an open discussion for the rest of the breakout. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll challenge their ability to turn on. So for those who were here yesterday or in, in, you know, just like yesterday, let's try and make sure we're using the microphones just so that everyone can hear. Um, but Dan has a microphone. I can walk around with one. I think some other folks are walking. Yeah, we have like five microphones. <laughs> so we always need five hands up. Uh, I mean, I could start with one if. Go for it. Um, <clears throat> let's see, which one of these is it to? Um, I guess the first bullet point. So, am, am I okay? All right. Um, so when you buy, uh, well actually, first a question for you, Albert. The, the one year thing on the NO2 sensors, was that specifically just for like that B series sensor or is it like the A and the C series as well or? Uh. So yeah, I should, I should be more clear. That was empirically determined. Okay. Um, yeah, we were using the, B, the NO2 B4. Um, we did not sort of systematically do it, do the assessment for all the different series. That's what we were using at the time. And the one year is actually, it's based, it's really, it's, it's like total ozone exposure. So it depends on your ozone concentration. So the, you know, it was one year at the typical ozone concentration that we had in our location. Um, you know, so if you're in a lower ozone 
an area with lower ozone, you'll probably get longer lifetime. If you're in a place with higher ozone, it'll be shorter. And then um, I guess my discussion question was, so when you buy an AlphaSense NO2 or ozone or anything, um, it comes with some, you know, calibration curve plot or whatever, where it gives you the millivolts and the PPM, PPB. Is it, do we think it's enough? I, this might be a naive question, but do we think it's enough to, to trust that? Or do we always need to develop our own calibration curves in our own labs with our own, you know, reference NO2 and CO monitors? I don't, what do people think? Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Kruti, and I represent one of the manufacturing community. Um, we have a calibration lab, and we get a lot of alpha sense sensors. What we've experienced or seen is that the, I agree with your point, the manufacturer or alpha sense, they have a basic calibration curve with millivolt per PVB as well as with temperature. They themselves say that it's basic calibration model with temperature that is carried out from a batch of sensors. It does not represent each and every sensor will behave the same in every temperature. Like if, if one sensor has a curve with 20, 30, 40 degrees, not the, the, like another sensor from the same batch will not have the same curve. So they always recommend that having a special uh, customized calibration curve with temperature for each and every sensor would increase their accuracy. Right. Any other? Thank you for that comment. Other, other sort of thoughts or comments on calibrating gas sensors? Doing them in batches, doing them, oh, good. Um, so I, I think uh, some of the work uh, that we followed um, on working on the Carl's uh, methods that he has used using the um, hybrid models, um, which you are well aware of. Um, so we, we kind of seen that uh, using RH and temperature is a kind of critical variable while kind of developing the calibration model. Um, so, um, and that is that was not something, I mean, even in the paper also, Carl mentions that um, and different kind of models have different performances for different gas sensors. Um, for CO, I think uh, we ended up using the uh, multiple linear regression model that was uh, proposed, and for other gases, um, yeah, uh, we did the hybrid calibration. So we kind of and also it depends on the concentration. <laughs> so which is a, like a, a great, I guess, a source of discussion, like uh, how like the methods developed in US or Europe is going to be translated in this region. So yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Um, hi, so thank you for this. And you know, this aligns with a lot of what we have also seen with gas calibrations. I noticed you didn't show SO2 here. Um, <laughs> um, how has your experience been? Have you tested out SO2 at all? <clears throat> and are there any models that have worked for you there? And then uh, another question was, you know, during calibration, like uh, generally what do you recommend as a good time period for co-locating with reference? Uh, and how much data do you collect for calibrations of the sensors? Cool. So I thought those were two super good questions. I'm going to throw it out to anyone. Who has used SO2 and gotten good data out of them? And then also, how long do we need calibration data for? Do you have your hand up there? No? Oh, in the back, though. You got it? Okay. Uh, hello, sir. I am from. Uh, I am Amita from uh, Aeron System. We are using the Alpha Sense sensors, and uh, same. Uh, we have uh, developed the calibration lab, and same. Uh, whatever in your data sheet, you have given the graph like uh, millivolt versus concentration. So uh, we we are getting the reverse graph and reverse trend. Same for the SO2, uh, SO2 and NO2. Both sensors are not performing at uh, well, and uh, not giving the good relation at the lowest detection limit. So how to eliminate that uh, uh, yeah, issues? 
Yeah. Does, has anyone had good and experience sir, second, with the uh, SO2 sensors? Second question <laughs> is, uh, you, you have uh, given the B and B plus series. So uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned four algorithms. So that's four algorithms, uh, uh, same apply for the B plus series and uh, H plus series? Uh, do you, do you, can you comment on performance for the different model, different model types for different sensor series? Actually looked at uh, SO2, so the problem with SO2 is in Bangalore the concentrations are very low. Uh, that becomes a problem, we are not able to train models on it, we don't have enough data to train models, so we don't have a comparison as such. Yeah, so for uh, SO2 sensors, uh, what we see is that like right now we have not built the, built the models for SO2, uh, mainly because the SO2, as, uh, as Nira mentioned, the SO2 levels were very low. So what I've read in papers is that say is if the SO2 concentration is uh, lesser than 40 ppb, uh, the performance of the electrochemical sensors might not be that good that you, uh, you wouldn't be able to detect it. So in situations where, uh, say, it is uh, near to some factories or thermal power plants where you have a higher concentration of SO2, uh, if you are able to collocate in such uh, uh, locations and see, I think that can be done. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, so, then regarding uh, different types of sensor series, right now we have been evaluating uh, a, uh, a series and the B, B1 for the ele electrochemical sensor. So the long-term performance, right now we are not in a position uh, to uh, tell, but maybe in the next few months we'll be able to see that difference. But did you see any differences between the A4 and the B4 series? Uh, in the short-term performance evaluation, we are not uh, observing. Not but uh, yet to be tell told like in, right now, uh, like in the long-term performance, may we may observe. I'm not sure of that part. I can add that we had a similar experience with the SO2 sensors. They don't work super well. But they're also hard to calibrate because SO2 in our domain was for 9,000 hours. There are 9,000 hours in a year, right? For five hours, the concentration would be 80 parts per billion, and for the other 8,995 hours, it was close to zero. So it was hard to get enough data to sort of properly calibrate them. Um, they also, but they're also not super sensitive. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. So, so far we have seen a lot of manufacturers, lot of sensors is there. So, particular location, we have been seeing different kind of accuracy in the same place. So, what is your recommendations? Like there are multiple regression models like Dr. Nero, like you know, I explained. There are X boost is better for this and other linear and other lot of kind of statistical things he explained. So what is your recommendation? What is your uh, key takeaway? Which one we can follow for particular for all the uh, manufacturer for all the sensors? I'm going to assume that all questions are asked for the royal we, so they're for the for the room. So anyone want to comment on that? What's the Subu, what is the best model architecture for converting sensor signals to, uh, to concentration? <laughs> you want to expand on that? All right, fine. Uh, okay. So I think, the uh, so if you talk to a sensor manufacturer like AlphaSense, right, uh, they will give you a sensor sensitivity to the analyte. So, so many nano amps per PPB or PPM, as the case may be, that's based on laboratory testing conditions, right? Uh, and very controlled environments. So, when you put it out into the real world, you have a lot of nonlinearities and uh, uh, what do you call it, cross interferences with other pollutants. Uh, so, if you simply stick to your linear uh, you know, calibration factor, this is more typical to like analytical instruments that are again controlled like reference monitors and all that, right? Uh, but you have a lot of interference from temperature, relative humidity, plus if you think about gas sensors, which are typically electrochemical sensors, chemistry is highly dependent on temperature. So if you calibrate it at like 22 degrees Celsius, like a typical CAQMS, 
it'll work at that point of time. But if it goes up to 35, 40 degrees Celsius, and in parts of India, 40 degrees Celsius is not that unusual, or it can get really cold. And so this, number one, the base linear re the response of the electrochemical sensor can change uh, based on temperature. Second, humidity can have an impact, which can be transient or you know, sometimes longer duration. Or else there's interferences. Uh, I think there's like uh, H2S can impact some sensors, or hydrogen can impact some sensors, and depending on what is the environmental impact. So, I mean, while I definitely love to use linear regression models just because they are really transparent and PM sensors usually work that way, carbon monoxide kind of can work that way. Uh, but for things like uh, sulfur dioxide or you know something like nitrogen NO2 or ozone, as Emil was showing earlier today, you're, uh, you're, uh, I'm not a computer scientist. What is it? Non-parametric models? What do you call random forest? Anyways, okay, right. So non-parametric models like machine learning or uh, you know random forest or support rate regression or XGBoost, they work a whole lot better at capturing these. Uh, confounding effects and non-linearities in a much better manner than linear regression. So it really comes down to what is the analyte you are uh, trying to measure, what is the concentration range uh, in the ambient, in, in your, in your you know, target uh, conditions, plus how different is it from your laboratory conditions. So all of these factors have to go into effect, but the ideal one would really, to my mind, is really just a simple linear conversion Right, but that may not always work. So again, it depends. All right, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a provocative question, or hopefully provocative. So there were several questions today during the sessions about, you know, that, that kind of boiled down to: Do you include meteorological parameters in your in your calibration model? And I assume that meant: Do you include things beyond temperature and humidity? So I would like to hear an argument for what meteorological parameters people would, are interested in seeing and why you think that would be something to include. I should also add I just agree with everything Subu just said. So no, I agree. So, so, so what, yeah, so aside from temperature and humidity, what, what meteorological parameters are, are, are folks asking about when they're saying that for their calibration models and why, why should those be included? Because everyone squirms in their seat now. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I think uh, uh, are you asking this question in terms of uh, collocation or collocating two sensors with a, something like calibration models? Just open ended. Okay. So I think um, well, one of the factors what uh, we have seen is uh, the height of the planetary boundary layer. Uh, that's something uh, kind of plays a good role in controlling the outdoor or the ambient uh, pollutant concentration. Um, however, um, that may not be always the case for uh, gaseous sensors. Um, I guess for gaseous sensors, I guess um, the solar radiation is something that might be an important uh, meteorological variable, um, like what time of the day, um, and, and that sort of kind of drives the, uh, the conversion between the Gas, gases uh, that are present in the atmosphere. So it's just a, like a, maybe an educated guess that I did. <laughs> Bold, okay. <laughs> yeah, here. So not, not necessarily a meteorological factor, kind of, uh, but I think, Albert, your slides just made a pretty good case for uh, the sensor age being a function of, uh, or sorry, the, the concentration being a function of sensor age. So is that something that we should include in these models? I've seen it done. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> I think also when we are dealing with the, like the Papua Air, the low cost monitors, it is very important that we report the relative humidity 
because it's a, it's a very big influence of the kind of data that you get. Uh, so I just wanted to add something to what Manmoy said. Uh, regarding solar radiation, um, you know, I think it may have an effect, the amount of light that you're getting, and it can be like some fractions of, I mean, what, what intensity? So the intensity during the day can be high and low. Even if there's a cloud cover, how does it affect? May help in improving the model slightly. We can, uh, if, if we have some uh, measurements, we can check the effects and then see. Yeah. Can expand. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Not, not. No, I was expanding the question, but how many people here have actually built calibration models? Have you already asked this? No. Okay. How many people here have actually built calibration models for gas sensors? Kevin, yes. Uh, ML, yes. Uh, not us. All right. <laughs> and so, I mean, I know what you do, Kevin, but I'm going to ask her. What are the variables that you use in your calibration model? Yes, so I think already. So my name is Kruti, and I represent OISM Instruments. So we are one of the OEMs of air quality monitors. Uh, I wouldn't say calibration models and machine learning model, but we do include temperature, humidity, and cross interference gases, definitely because they are the major parameters that would affect the current value from the electrochemical sensors. They haven't worked. <laughs> So we tried <laughs> pressure. Pressure sometimes, uh, it, but the, the effect of atmospheric pressure is very limited. So it, it is not long-term effect. So including it in a calibration model would actually be an uh, incorrect method. So these are the important parameters that would work so far. Yeah. Someone has... Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to answer this in a, in a reverse way. We use four parameters, OP1, OP2, temperature, and RH, right? Uh, since uh, we had random forest as the evaluation model here, uh, I'm going to first ask Nero on the comment on the size of the random forest model that... So the data was for over two months. Um, for PM2.5, we had hourly values. So for the gas sensors? For gases, we had 15 minute values. So I think around 4,000 to 5,000 points. The size of the model? Uh, the parameters you're talking about? The four parameters, right, I'm assuming? Yeah. So what was the resultant size of the model for each of these devices? An approximate range, ballpark? I, I don't understand. Size okay. is in what? Do you what? mean by uh, the, number of variables? Yeah, yeah num because increasing the number of variables. Or in will, random forest, it can be a number of trees or yeah. Yeah. tries. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. uh, so for. And uh, by the way, these are like two data scientists from IIT Bombay talking to each other. So, you know, <laughs> this will probably go over my head. So, so it was, uh, so as far as I remember for NO2, we had around 30 trees, resident trees, and each were at a depth of four to five. Um, and you have like multiple trees, that's how it works. I mean, you take an average across all the trees too. So, to uh, once, from our experiment, what we observed mm -hmm. after the random forest model, we tried interpreting the model. Mm -hmm. As Subhu mentioned, there was a transparency problem. Uh, with the random forest model, so something like SHAP, your Shapley additive value approximations or partial differential functions can help out uh, investigate what's the effect of these four parameters on the model output. And what we have observed is your OP1, which is your working electrode, has the highest impact on the uh, concentration output, followed by OP2, which is your auxiliary electrode, followed by temperature, and the least impact was shown by relative humidity in terms of the uh, impact on the concentration output through a random forest model. So, so I'd like to add to this. So we, what we use is, is OP1 minus OP2 to build Fair the enough. model but because that is uh, the difference. Yeah. Uh, and I did show a plot of uh, the permutation importance. So basically if you randomize one of the variables, you see what is the effect on the model performance. We see that, th so I'm calling NO2 which is OP1 minus OP2 has a maximum um, uh, ma maximum impact followed by CO concentration because there are reactions that happens, uh, temperature and the last one was O3. So, so uh, instead of that subtraction model of OP1 and OP2 as a feature, mm -hmm. uh, what we tried to, uh, why I didn't uh, prefer that is because each gas sensor, uh, B4 series specifically, 
uh, has a different baseline. Okay. Your O3, uh, O3 or NO2 OP1 may vary from 220 to 240. Uh, some sensor may have 260 as a baseline and then vary according to the concentrations, right? So uh, what we implemented is uh, a ratio of OP1 by OP2 and therefore it negates out uh, the other absolute values in terms of the uh, millivolt levels. Uh, this helped us also to create a median model uh, for all the gas sensors because the ratio uh, we, would, which we were able to create uh, rather than the absolute numbers using the ratio. So we have three parameters, OP1 divided by OP2, which is the ratio, uh, temperature and RH. Now this uh, three parameters were also better when it came to median models like one single model for five devices or 10 devices which were co-located at the same time. Interesting, yeah. So we haven't heard anything about non-sensor uh, you know, non, uh, output temperature RH variables really, maybe right. some cross interference, cross pollutants that you might have measured some other way, but no other like wind speed, wind direction, solar radiation, planetary body layer height or land use type or something else. Yeah, so we had okay. solar radiation, I see. But I think wind, row, wind speed and wind direction might not be a, a variable because it may be very, lo very local uh, as compared to, you know, have. <laughs> so yeah, so I don't know. It sounds like there's among the folks, hopefully this is on, uh, among the folks who sort of done a bunch of model building, it, you know, it sounds like the met parameters, T and RH matter, you know, to varying degrees, and they matter for physical reasons about how the sensor operates, um, and that anything beyond that from a meteorological standpoint, um, sure, you could put it into a model and maybe it shows up and has some variable importance score, but it's not necessarily giving you information about how the sensor is operating. Yeah, and I think uh, just thinking back, I mean, you know, just uh, has anybody read this what, 2017 or 2018 paper by Gail Hagler? Like, yeah, one guy. <laughs> uh, this was uh, basically, you know, what, is, what are the variables you can use or when is a model not a model, right? Something like that. Uh, and basically, I mean, uh, Gail Higler is a scientist uh, at the US EPA, and you know, she worked, she had collaborators from AQSpec, Andrea Polidori, and a bunch of others. And basically, they put out a table uh, saying, these are the variables that are defensible in a model, and these are the variables that are not defensible in a model. And this was, you know, their opinion at the end of the day, it's a perspective piece. Uh, but basically, you know, things that we talked about, like physical pa parameters that are physically realistic would be on the defensible side of things, but things like wind direction, you know, wind speed, uh, land use type and all that, like time of day, day of week, month, all of these would not be acceptable as a, uh, as a, as a variable in your model, but something like, you know, as Dan mentioned, elapsed time, right? Age of the sensor, if you can quantify that, uh, sensor response varies over time, so that would be a defensible parameter. But if you haven't read that paper, I do I uh, recommend that you go read that. It's by H A G L E R, Hail Hagler, uh, and so that would be a good start. So there was a. I want to cycle circle back. There was a question about how much data do you need to be able to build a model, and I'm going to pick on Mike, even though I know he's tired. Because you showed some data, and it was PM data, but you showed data in your talk about Af Afroset that you needed separate seasonal models, right? And this idea that the, the conditions were different enough in the dry and wet season. And that plays a role in, in having enough data. And also, I guess the way to phrase it as a question is, if you have to recalibrate for every season, right, you can't just make one model that works for the whole year, how much, like, are you doing anything other than calibrating? How much does that affect your ability to actually operate these sensors as sensors in a network as opposed to just at a central site where you're constantly checking that they're doing okay? Yeah, um, lots. No, I was actually just thinking of this 
in a slightly different way. Do we, are there any like policy or very, very closely policy adjacent people in this room? Yeah. So my question is, is, is similar. The way I would phrase it is, at what point does the, the spatial and temporal monitoring that you can get from these sensors, at what point is that outweighed by the inaccuracy or potential inaccuracy of them? Like your, your inability to, to be confident in, in the data that they're giving. Like at, what, at what point do you, are they useful and not useful? Yeah, I think uh, that depends upon the data validations and of course the uh, our central government, the policy makers, they actually are yet to accept this data as uh, the national standard. So still we are waiting uh, for that. Uh, after that we can able to say that whether uh, the entire network can be, the uh, sensor based network can be useful in our country or not. So, may I ask? So, oh, yeah. So there's different. <clears throat> there's different. I totally understand what you're saying about sort of attainment level status, right? Um, I mean, there's a level of information that's sort of below that, right? There's the gold standard to say, all right, are we meeting some standard? But there's a level of information below that that lets people make decisions or sort of say, well, we think there's. We think there might be an exceedance in this area, right? So, what could you comment then on? All right, what would the, you know, what are the requirements to meet that lower standard, right? Um, if you or that lower sort of level of um, information. No, no. It's a question of methodology. You see, because uh, the national think tank they are on working on the methodology. We have the analyzer-based uh, continuous monitoring stations and also manual stations. The me this methodology is quite different than the methodology used in the sensor-based uh, monitoring, air quality monitoring station. That's the point. Okay. So, so Albert can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way the US EPA treats this is you can use a sensor to identify a potential area where you might need to deploy a real monitor. <laughs> I think you can, but there's not a regulatory definition for the sensors. Right. It is up to the discretion of each state, and they can use it as part of what they would call a weight of evidence. Um, but there's not like a standard for sensors the way there is a standard the standard for the regulatory monitors is literally in the law, um, and that such a thing does not exist for the sensors in the U.S. At least that's my understanding. I think I'm mostly up to date. Did you want to add on this? What do, what do community do? Uh, yeah. <sighs> right, is there anyone here from like civil society or community groups that has used sensors? Do you want to talk about your experience a little bit? Yeah. Cool. I'm going to get some water. Yeah, so uh, hey, how you doing? My name's Trevor Durning. Uh, I'm Dan's research technician. Uh, I, I uh, started a nonprofit in New Jersey in the United States, and uh, I put a purple air up in my backyard uh, because I was noticing that there was a film on my vehicles at my house, um, and immediately was getting some crazy readings. And I wanted to figure out how I could communicate data uh, to not only the people in the communities, but to be able to communicate better with the government. And uh, I just went to the New Jersey Air Reports, they're called, and uh, looked at the technology that they were using, which was high split. And I figured out how they made their models. And I made my own models based on my data and brought it to them. And they actually put a sensor a mile from my house, a regulatory sensor. Uh, so they, you know, began to monitor and, uh, you know, people were trying to do that for 14 years and I got it done in six months. So I think this raises a uh, question for everybody that, you know, when you communicate with the government using their technology, 
is, is important. So I, I don't know if they're using high split here in India, um, but if you can leverage, you know, essentially their data in order to drive some action, uh, it's, it's extremely impactful. And the story that it tells, um, you know, is, can't really be refuted. And I think that's uh, something that we all need to work on is, you know, communicating not only to the people in the community, but bridge the gap between, you know, the community and the government. Um, so if you can do that using the sensor technology that we're talking about, especially with uh, gases, I guess that's maybe the next place that I'm going, because I started this with uh, PM 2.5, um, you know, that's, that's where I think this, this th that's where I think our next step is. We've all been talking about, oh, well, you know, I use this type of, uh, I use this type of um, plot to show data, and I use this type of plot to show data, and we're all arguing, when really if we just use the structures that have been given to us, uh, we can drive action, uh, you know, faster. And, and I think we're there, I think, we've, I think we have the technology, even if the sensors are gonna go bad in a year, let's replace them every year and let's, let's uh, make sure that the data, if, if we're capturing data and it's similar to the government's data, at least we know it's viable data, right? And then making sure that we can bridge gaps. And I, I just wanted to, I don't know, that's pretty much what I've been trying to say this whole time, but is that kind of what you wanted to hear? You wanna hear yes. anything else? No, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, just let's um, bridge the gaps, guys. We got it. <laughs> So who here um, has used some of these gas sensors, it, you know, especially sort of asking folks in India, but not exclusively? Um, and if you haven't, you know, if you've only used PM sensors, what is the, what's the roadblock? What's preventing you from using the gas sensors? Nope. Yep. So, this is non-C step, just so that you know, I don't suck okay. bias. So my previous role, we started with PM 2.5 and NO2 sensors, and then as we learned along, we realized that you needed um, ozone sensors as well. So NO2, ozone, PM, and weather when parameters. Um, it took exactly three months for the NO2 data to look absolutely horrible, um, so much so that the replacement cost so one year of PM 2.5 versus three months of gas sensors. Uh, it did not help. And apart from the cost, we were licensing with pollution control boards who had access to a closed dashboard. And they would see the sensors data before ours, match it to their CAQMs and say, oh my God, this is horrible. So eventually we had to stop. So it just remained for PM. So Till we are able to improve performance and long-term performance, it's very difficult to build faith already when there is a lot of, uh, for lack of a bet, lack of trust in the in the data. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? No one. Come on, you guys had so many questions yesterday. So many. No one has anything to say? Yes. <laughs> what? Uh, I'm going to, like, uh, I'm Kiran. Uh, I, I want to change tracks a little bit. Uh, are there any viable alternatives to uh, electrochemical sensors? Because they're, they have a very short lifespan and the data is not really like reliable. So we should be looking at something that works well instead of like using ones that don't work like that. So has anybody come across any alternatives sensing gas? Anyone want to comment? Has anyone used not electrochemical sensors and had good success with it? Or read about it? Or heard about it? Or saw it at a meeting? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, the other common options is metal oxide sensors, and those are even worse. So that's probably, well, at least for some species. So I think that's probably 
a non-starter. Um, but for for VOCs at least, there's a lot of promise on the um, photo ionization detectors, PIDs. Um, so I think, I don't know if the, uh, the Sensit guys want to chime in any on that, but they've really been excellent on, on PIDs. I can, uh, can I add something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've seen some uh, publications like in scientific literature, mostly from chemist labs or you know, chemistry, chemical engineering people. Is it like too close to the sound? Anyways, where they've tested uh, the sensitivity of different, I don't know whether it is SNO2 or some sensor like that uh, to detect some gases. Usually these are at much higher concentrations than you'd see in the ambient. Uh, or else they are in you know really lab condition. So I haven't really seen any of them being commercialized. Uh, I think some of the background for electrochemical sensors, uh, just like your you know, plant tower sensors, is that they are manufactured in mass quantities, and electrochemical sensors are used for like exhaust gas monitoring, where concentrations are much higher, mixing you know, concentrations much higher. So it's not as much sensitivity that's a big issue there. Uh, but when you're doing it, putting it in the ambient conditions, that's where you get a lot of detection limit issues. Uh, you get cross interferences become significant, and that becomes a challenge. But uh, yeah, I mean, there are some, I mean, you can definitely look at you know, your a American Chemical Society sensors journal or something like that, where you have a lot of these different uh, prototypes that are being tested in labs, but I haven't really seen any of them being fleshed out into a commercial product yet. So I'm going to take a previous question I asked and spin it around. So before I asked who had used sensors for gases and what was sort of the roadblocks, and I didn't get a ton of responses. So are you interested in using gas sensors, but you like? don't know where to start or feel like it's sort of this insurmountable problem, right? And what are the, what are the, what are the barriers to adopting them if you want to use them? Yep. So maybe not an answer, maybe another question to your question. Sure. So um, there's a project we are handling in Ghana, removing pollution from play where we seek to um, redesign some streets into um, play area for school children. And then um, the project lead wanted to um, monitor gases, NO2, because of the traffic, um, vehicular movement along that stretch. Now, um, initially they thought of filter-based, since that's what they've heard about. Um, I didn't also have much knowledge on gas sensors, and so couldn't advise initially on that. However, upon talking to Afriset, um, someone from Afriset, I got to know that there's um, a company that produces some of these gas sensors. So um, I tried advising. Since the filter-based, we were going to get um, just um, data for some couple of days, and you need to be taking out the filter, replacing it, and all. So to avoid those challenges, why don't we install the gas sensor um, to be able to get continuous data for a while? But however, it was difficult to convince the lead. They did not, at the end of the day, buy into my idea. They felt that um, for accuracy sake, um, they thought that the filter-based system works well, and they were not so sure about the gas sensors, and so couldn't go with it. They contacted the manufacturers all right, but they didn't proceed on that. So in this sense, um, I want to ask, how accurate is this data from the gas sensors, and how do they vary from that of the filter base? Oh, and so when you say filter base, you mean these like passive samplers yeah, and you send yeah, them to yeah. a lab? I think they're less sensitive than I think they're less accurate than the passive sensors, but it's but the passive sensor is giving you one data point for a week, right? So, um, like I couldn't quote specific accuracy. I think you'd have to look in the and it depends on your conditions, but 
But yeah, so there, there's a story about, um, right, the, you said the PI didn't want to do it. He didn't trust it, or she, he. Anyone else, what are the other, you know, if you want to use gas sensors, you've thought about it, why aren't you? Or what's preventing you? Or what would you want to know that would allow you to use them? Oh, me. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, I, I would say that at least in a lot of my work, it's the inability to actually uh, calibrate them, right? So, I, I mean, it, it's a silly, it, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit answer, but it's, it's the truth, right? Even, even where we do have reference monitors for certain gases, even just getting the consumables to make sure those reference monitors are working correctly, having the necessary expertise to do those calibration on those reference monitors, so you do the zeros, you do the spans, making sure that those are operating at the, as they should, making sure that you have um, you know, Teflon lines that aren't super old, and it, it's, at some point it's a materials thing, and uh, part of that is also capacity, but. Not a great answer, but it's 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 a it's a truthful one. Anyone else want to comment? Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, I just came in now, and um, the if I want to use gas sensor, what will discourage me is the sensitivity that will be reduced within um, some time. And then I have to keep on replacing the sensor. That is one. Then the other one, what Victoria just said about um, passive sampling, using that for monitoring gases. I don't know if we can use that. I know we can use passive sampling to monitor um, POPs and then um, active for metals and so on. So I don't know how to use filters for monitoring um, gaseous pollutants. I don't know if it's possible. That's a question. Oh, yeah, so they sell these little badges and you just send them to a lab. They, they cost, I don't know, how much does it cost? It costs $80 for each one or something, right? And then you put them out for a week and then you send it to a lab. So, I don't know much about it, but what I learned is that um, they take the samplers, um, the filters, and then they are supposed to keep it cold, transport it to US, um, a lab, and at the lab they do some filter-based analysis to retrieve data for um, NO2. So it's basically done at the lab. Um, so for us, um, that's the focus um, the project was on, NO2. They, they sell them for a bunch of different gases, but you have to buy one for each gas. And then you pay for the analysis, yeah. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, okay. Hi. So, sorry, get back to, I'm just thinking now. So, when we are doing sensor calibration, so as experts told, like, they are considering metallurgical parameters such as temperature, humidity, and like as... Bren Mai told that uh, boundary layer will play a major role, and Nero also explained that solar radiation. Other than that, like have you, we have heard like LU, LUC parameters, like land use, land cover parameters such as vegetation, green spaces, and proximity of water bodies. So, will these parameters incorporate into the when we are doing sensor calibration? If it is, how much like well, will we will we get the accuracy of what we have pollutants or gases? What are, so what is your comment on that? All right, does someone else want to comment on that? I have a strong opinion about that. <laughs> I think the only things in your model should be things that physically describe what your sensor is doing. And so that should be the gas you're measuring or the signals of the gas you're measuring, any interference and then modifiers of it. Like the nearby land use should not be in your calibration model, in my opinion, period. <laughs> Um, different 
tack on this, but for the modelers in this room, not, not building calibration models, but like larger scale models, at what point, if you have a good emissions inventory, is that going to be more accurate in just like a GCM or a CTM than using these low cost sensors? Like wh where's the trade off point? Now, at what point is it better just to concentrate on that than it is to do low cost gas sensing? I don't know the answer to that, but we have the hands up. Who, here, who here runs models? Because other than Dan <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, Emil, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, when I feel that if you are using uh, land use variables, like the main thing is from local sensor, we are trying to find the hotspots. Now, if you are training uh, in a particular location with these uh, land use variables, we are in the model itself, we are putting these factors. And then once you uh, take, uh, take the sensor and put it in the side, the sensors can be, it might not, uh, because it is already telling that like, it has already different parameters. The more parameters you add, the more it will try to take that trend. So you, are not a, you won't be able to sometimes identify the real hotspots when you are adding these land use variables and, other, and making the model more complex. So that's my op opinion. <laughs> so that's an argument. You're, you're agreeing not to put all of these other parameters into the but model. But these LU, LUC is the major parameters, right? If you're going urban or if you're going rural, this will play a major role, right? So how can we incorporate these things? This is the, I'm going to look at Mike. So if you want to have a sensor in an urban area versus a rural area, and you want them to both to work sort of equally well, right? I know my opinion on this, but I want to hear someone else's. I, I think we share the same opinion. <laughs> so it's, don't look at me. <laughs> so I think our opinion is then you just have to calibrate it in more than one place. Right, which I know is not like a satisfying answer and it doubles the amount of work, but I don't know. I think if your, calib if your calibration model for the sensor is, has something about where exactly it is, then it's not a, you're not transforming the output from the sensor to get a concentration. You have some other model and your sensor is sort of just a part of it, right? I don't know, like I think if you're measuring something, you need the, the signal of what you're measuring to be the key. <laughs> The key, the key component to what you use to turn the signal into, into concentration. All right, so, yeah. I wanted to go back to uh, Mike's question. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. so Mike, uh, you were saying, you know, is, is an, a model with good emissions inventories and good everything ever like good enough to just focus on that instead of worrying about the intricacies of, you know, calibrations of gas sensors? I think it's, it's definitely interesting and, and a worthy question philosophically. I mean, you could also, you could bring up the same argument with like Mara 2 reanalysis or something like that. But um, I mean, if you ever like, look in great detail in the way that um, even like the best emissions inventories are made. There's just so many like wild assumptions <laughs> uh, that I feel like it is maybe a, a, a level higher of uncertainty than we're even like dealing with, with um, you know, calibration of gas sensors. And I know um, if, uh, if to put uh, Dr. Paul Njogu on the spot here, he's building an emissions inventory for uh, PM in Nairobi. Uh, and so I would maybe invite him to uh, share a few words on what are the key uncertainties uh, and, and how uncertain everything is with uh, building emissions inventories for PM and other emissions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dan. I have to first of all acknowledge that what we are doing basically is depending on, dependent on what you taught us. So we have benefited so much from your experience and uh, we really appreciate that. So yes, we are in the process of developing an emission inventory for the city of Nairobi. Uh, we have developed methods. Uh, we are also using methods that have been developed and uh, I believe our train, I've seen our trainers here today, uh, WRI, WRI India, 
Ritesh, I don't know whether he is here. Uh, they trained us in 2023. One of the challenges that uh, we face is the accuracy. And even the reproducibility. If you measure today, and then you go back to the same vehicle or to the same source, you find a lot of deviations. But uh, as Dan has properly put it, the deviations are large, and we are allowing a margin of error of around 12%. I think we, ca we cannot be talking about very accurate data because the kind of measurements that we do in the environment are very different from what we could do in the lab because maybe the vehicle today was properly maintained, tomorrow it has taken a dotrated fuel, or maybe a plug is not working. So there are so many things that come into play. I don't know whether that answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I think my, oh, oh, Faye has it, yeah. I just wanted to say that those two issues are the exact same two issues that we have with the low-cost gas sensors, right? So at, at what point is it a trade-off, you know, focusing on one thing versus the other? Hello. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment, you know, listening to a few of the, the questions and discussion, you know, a lot, a lot of what we've been talking about at this conference so far has been PM sensors, right? And I think that when it comes to calibrating PM sensors, the sensitivity is sometimes to the composition of the particles, right? But with gas sensors, you're just detecting molecules, right? Um, and so I can see why somehow incorporating the different sources of particles may be tempting or even advisable because you may be somehow capturing the different optical properties you can expect of the local particles, right? Um, but for gases, I guess there's interference from other gases which might be there, but I think that the, as Albert was saying, the dependence on what's happening locally would be less, I think, for gas sensors because it's molecule by molecule rather than this complex mixture that's inside a particle that could be different from different sources. All right, I'm going to try and ask... So we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to try and ask one more provocative question. So this, this breakout was about gas sensors, you know, and, and we asked a few different ways, you know, how many people are using them. And not a lot of hands went up. Not a lot of folks are using gas sensors in the room. So when Subu asked me at dinner, should he have a session in next year's conference on gas sensors? Should I tell him no? Should I tell him yes? What should I tell him? Yes? Someone elaborate on their yes, please. What do you want to learn? What, what, what needs to be included? Yeah, I think, you know, this technology, as we utilize it more, it's, it, it's going to get better. And I just want to remind everybody, you know, why we're doing this. It's to create action, right? We're trying to inform people, get people involved and you know have the government take action in some way shape or form and a year from now hopefully you know we have some cowboys and cowgirls in the room that put up some gas sensors and we're somebody's going to make mistakes and you know someone might come to you and tell you that your methods were wrong or maybe your methods were right we don't know yet right um, this technology is advancing and you know we have companies here and companies around the world that are, you know, building sensors for us and, and we just need to deploy them and see what happens. Um, but, you know, don't forget why we're doing this is really what I want everyone to take home with you. It's for, you know, the good of the people everywhere and hopefully the government takes notice. So a year from now, definitely we should be talking about gas sensors. They're not going anywhere and uh, hopefully the technology advances. So. You know, as, you, as we deploy these and we gather data, uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's more useful in a year than it is now. We've noticed that there's a pretty high uncertainty. Um, don't, don't be afraid, you know. Let's, let's just get them out there and see what happens. The worst that could happen is you got to replace the sensor in a year because you realize that it was faulty. And I understand that there's a cost involved with that, but hopefully you know, the cost is mitigated in the future. 
Um, so, you know, just remember why we're doing this, y'all. I, I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. There's a lot worse that can happen if your data goes and it finds its way to someone and creates a problem. And it is fundamentally incorrect data, right? There are, there have been a few instances where people have taken uncalibrated sensors of various types, brought this to the attention of policymakers. The policymakers come to the scientists and say, "Hey, what are you doing? This is, you know, you're you're you're, you're out here telling the people that they're breathing deadly air when, in reality, it's not the case, right?" Um, you, I, I think there, there has to be some care, especially with these gas sensors. Yeah, just to come back, right? If the government, if, if you do raise awareness to the government and they do put out a, a reference grade sensor for the gases and they find no gas there, then, then you know, at least there's some sort of dialogue that was created there. And I've noticed that you know there's there's dialogue that's not happening in some areas of my country that I wish it was. All right, so you know there's two sides to every sword, and I do see that. I totally agree with you. You know, get with a get with someone who can set up a correction model for you uh, and work with them. Definitely is the way to go. Um, but again, it's I like to see more action now. Uh, just with the use of the sensors, right? So I'm all about action. I'm just trying to drive people to do the right thing, right? All right, other thoughts on, yeah, so my prompt was, should I tell Subu that, we, that there needs to be a gas sensor session or not? And I heard some yes, there should be one, so what do you want to learn from it? What's the, what would the goal be, right? You look like you want to say something. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely there should be a session. Uh, more or less, uh, I think it should be an experience sharing session. Like for example, uh, there are a couple of organizations, for-profit, non-profit communities. Uh, they may have their own experiences in deploying these sensors. And while calibration and all our mathematical approaches, we can debate over them, publish, whatever. Uh, however, their usability, uh, their place, uh, how do they find their traction within the regulatory environment? And therefore, we need to build a use case and a community around it in order to ensure that it finds its way to uh, more regulatory discourse as well. Yeah, so you, uh, in, in summary, yes, we should have it. Uh, and it should be a more or less uh, experience sharing session. Any other, any other comments on that? What do you want to see, right? So we have one vote for an experience sharing session. What else do people want to see about this? I think I think that's probably the right way to do it. If if I was if I had you know, magical wand and I could make something happen, it would be for everyone in the room to have, let's say, an ozone sensor, an electrochemical sensor that they can deploy for a year and come back in one year and then you can share the experience on that, right? Because it seems like actual hands-on experience of is, is sort of the limiting factor right now is the bottleneck. So maybe that's like sort of the push area is just to get some out there and, and see what happens a little bit with <laughs> keeping in mind my, uh, <laughs> my, my caveat here. So maybe, maybe that is the way to do it and, and just come back in a year and, and talk about it. Yeah. Someone's coming. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think the uh, manufacturers of um, gas sensors should be involved. And um, I think they have tried to convince and let us know that the sensors are OK working well, uh, I think they should be involved and then um, they can clarify, argue, and um, 
convince us on what to do uh, if we have issues. Thank you. Yeah, also maybe by the end of next year, we should have figured out how to improve their performances. Like, uh, you know, more innovations, more disruptions probably, and share them so that everybody else can also hop in on the bandwagon and keep going at it. But I, I don't think it's time to stop anywhere, just keep going. Cool. Other comments? All right, so I'm gonna make one more sort of throw out there. Any other topics that people wanted to cover that, that we haven't? So we have about eight minutes left. Is there time? I'll just quick question. Yeah, yeah, go It's not question. Uh, we are talking about so, so many like um, processes and all. Is there any strict SOP, single SOP, the all manufacturers, all sensor user people can follow the SOP, standard operating procedure. So we'll get a better uh, resultant, either gas or either pollutant, whatever. So is there any is there, or if not, why we'll have such kind of things instead of following different, because I have individual methodology, individual calibration, then I'll show different results. And you have a different calibration, you have, but instead of that, can we have a standard, SOPs for calibration among all sensors or manufacturers. I'm just commenting. I'd yeah, I'm going to look at. Do you want to answer this? <laughs> yeah, right now, uh, like the basic performance metrics are, be are the common ones that are being uh, used. Like uh, whether it is the US EPA guidelines or uh, the AFRISET uh, or the AQ spec, everywhere we are using the uh, sim uh, similar performance metrics. And uh, there is a like commonly what we could see is that a minimum of three nodes from each uh, manufacturer we are using uh, for evaluations. And uh, the calibrations, I think we are still in an exploring stage where uh, like I have not come across like an ex exact uh, for form where we should be going for calibrations. Like even right now, we also we were discussing like what are the different input uh, model inputs that we should bring, or uh, what is the best model that could use. I think that is something which is really in, in the research right now. But uh, regarding the uh, how you evaluate the sensors, right? I think that is already like we have certain performance metrics for it. that answer your question or but I, I don't know I think as Emil was saying there are a lot of people are following what either the US EPA or the AQ spec has said right and that's what they're doing that's what Mike's doing in Africa and I think those are probably really good resources all right any other comments or questions I'll just, I'll just throw one last thing out here, just because sure. I was just thinking about it. Um, you know, someone, I think it was Dan, mentioned that, or maybe it was you, mentioned that these sensors are really for like stack emissions, right? These electrochemical sensors, yeah. which are actually active samples and not passive samples, the way that we tend to kind of use these things in, <laughs> in ambient monitoring. Um, and I kind of wonder if maybe we should be changing the operating modes of how we're, how we're deploying these sensors and, and not treating them as passive samplers. Um, and if even just throwing like some homemade ozone scrubber in front of them with the pump behind them would be worthwhile and actually improve their uh, performance or not. So if someone needs a, needs a project for, for a master's student or something, yeah. you know. Someone summer project. All right. Anyone else? Any other comments? All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending this session. 
The posters are out. I think it is poster time until 6.30. If I, yes. Um, so yeah, please visit the posters, talk to the, you know, people worked hard on them, go, go talk to those folks. And I think there are some on gas sensors. So thanks everyone.